turn with me to Mark chapter 8. We are just going to concentrate on one verse uh, today. And that verse is number verse 36. Mark 8 verse 36. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? So I've entitled this as a, a theme as Profit and Loss. <coughs> when I graduated from university, um, well, I did mathematics at university, I was recruited to work in an audit firm. And uh, we, going about doing auditing meant doing quite a bit of accounts. And in accounts, there is what they call a double entry bookkeeping. For every um, debit, there is a credit, they say. Right? So, whatever, if you take money out of the bank, it must be going somewhere. So, you must make a posting somewhere. So, for every entry, there is you know, some, some opposite entry, as it were. Uh, so the profit and, and the loss comes from this double entry, you know, bookkeeping. Is there such a thing as profit and loss, as far as the Christian uh, community is concerned, the Christian, you know, message is concerned? I'd like to quote a bishop, I just got his name as Bishop Hooper, the night before he suffered martyrdom, he said, Life is sweet and death is bitter. But eternal death is more bitter and eternal life is more sweet. Eternal death is more bitter and eternal life is more sweet. When you hear the term profit and loss, it is a commercial term for these Galileans who are tradesmen. So the Lord is dealing with Galileans who are specifically involved in this business of trading. He said the Lord uh, does reach people where they are, at the point where they are. He appeals to them at their level, in their situation. If you look at uh, where, the way he dealt with the farmers, in Luke chapter 13, verse 15, the Lord then answered him and said, Hypocrite, does one, not each one of you, uh, on the Sabbath lose his own, his ox or donkey from the store and lead it, you know, to water. When he was dealing with the, with, uh, the fishermen in uh, Matthew 13, you know, 48, he says, Again, the kingdom of God in heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to the shore and they sat down and gathered, you know, goods in vessels and they threw the you know, the bad away. So they gathered the good in vessels and they threw away what was bad. So when he was dealing with um, a fishermen, he was giving an example from, you know, fishing. When he was dealing with a farmer, he's dealing with, with he's, he's giving examples from the oxen. And when he's dealing with the Galileans who were tradesmen, he's talking to them about a profit and loss. And I don't know what he would be saying to us in South Ashford today. I don't know what is, uh, that is common to us, something that is very common amongst the people. Now, this uh, book of Mark, if you look very closely at Mark chapter 8 and verse 29. Mark 8 verse 29, the Bible says, He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to him, You are the Christ. Then he strictly warned them that they should tell no one about him. What has been going on in this book of Mark up to, up to this point, up to chapter 8, verse 29, is the disciples were not sure who Jesus was. 
and uh, you know who is this man you know who can multiply uh, food who is this man who can perform these miracles they were not very clear and uh, at this particular point this is when they became very clear you know what, what do people say who oh, oh, i am or oh, some say you are the prophet or some people say you are this you are the other but then he said but who do you say that i am and they were able to say that you are the Christ. In other words, they got it right. And it has the point when they got it right that uh, Jesus says, now I am going to Jerusalem and I am going to die. And Peter says, there is no way you are going to do that. But you know that Jesus rebuked Peter for this kind of reaction. And then the Lord explains very clearly Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father you know, with the holy angels. When the disciples knew who Jesus was, Jesus told them plainly that they were going to suffer just as he was going to suffer. That they were going to die for their, faith, for their faith in Christ. And if you follow the stories of the apostles like Peter you know, and Paul and, and others, they were actually killed for the faith. When people knew the Lord Jesus Christ and followed him, he didn't promise them a bed of roses. He didn't promise them that they're going to have a lot of money and are going to live, to live a, a, a nice life in the world, as it were. He said, you are going to suffer just like I am going to suffer. Now what? is he trying to teach us in this particular verse? Let's, let's look at um, Acts 8 and verse 36. Let us look at it a little more in detail. The first thing you notice here, there is a discussion about the soul. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Now the soul or the spirit, um, you know, what, what lives forever. You know, we are made up of uh, the physical body. Um, the nurses can, 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 can correct us about this. You know, we, we have got uh, the physical body. But we also have what has been put in us, which is going to be forever. You see, when a, a person dies, the body is thrown away. But the soul lives forever. Say, so when God breathes in man, there is something in man that remains, you know, with that particular person. Now, he says that uh, you can lose your soul. Now, this is the thing that I would like us to, to consider. The soul is eternal. What it lives in us is eternal. And the body is going to die. You know, you, know you, you must have watched some of uh, the Hollywood people, you know, they may be very beautiful people, whether it's Hollywood or Bollywood or, or Nollywood, wherever it might be. You know, the young actors, very beautiful and so on. But as the years go by, oh, they are removed and then new ones are brought in. And then you know, and, and everybody dies, right? Everybody dies in this world. Whether, whether I like it or not, I am going to die one day. Whether you like it or not, you are going to die one day. 
But there is something that God has put in man, that is the soul of man, that is going to live, you know, forever. Now, there is such a thing as losing, you know, your soul. And that, that has to do with a, a person that rejects, you know, the, the, the Lord or is in love with the world. Now, let's look at um, just a little brief uh, description of the world. In uh, 1 John chapter 2, um, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15. What, what, what does the Bible mean when, when it says the world? 2 verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the last of it, but he who does the will of God abides, you know, forever. There is such a thing as loving the world. And they've summarized that what, what is in the world is simply, you know, this, that the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That is what forms, you know, the world. How do people gain the world? When people want to gain the world, you know, they want to gain these riches and so on. How do, how do they gain the world? Now, if you look at the passage we are looking at, you know, the Lord actually does explain, you know, how people go about this. Chapter 8 and verse uh, 38. It says, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. There are people in this world who just don't want anything to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. They just reject him. They want to have nothing to do with him. All they are interested in is to amass wealth, to have pleasure, to do anything they want under the sun. There is an example that the Lord gives us in, uh, in Luke chapter 18. Luke uh, chapter 18 and verse 18 of a young ruler. Now a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good, but one that is God. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, and do not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother. And he said, all these things I have kept from my youth. So when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when he heard this, he became very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he became sorrowful, he said, How hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of There are people who want to gain the world. Their whole lives are about material things. I think First John summarizes it very well. The lust of the flesh. Right? Whatever the body desires, they'll, they'll go and get it. Whether it is illegal or sex, they will go ahead and get it. Whether the property is not theirs, they want to go and get it. They want to kill someone to be able to get what they want. They go ahead and do it. There is such a craving for something in this, in this world. And they will do it at any cost. First 
First John summarizes it very well. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That is all that, that they're concerned about. And such a people, the Bible says, they have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't want to have anything to do with him. And when someone is like that, the moment they die, they will have lost their soul. Lost in the sense that they are no longer going to be with God. They are going to be an eternity without God. It is appointed unto man to die once, and after that comes judgment. If we die without coming to the Lord Jesus Christ, what awaits us, what awaits us is judgment. There is nothing else that is going to happen apart from being judged and being excluded from God forever and forever. You know, the pleasures of life will only last for a little while. We are on earth for 70 years, or if we're lucky, 80, or we can even reach 90, or maybe we might even get a, is it a, a cut from the queen or something, if you reach 100, right? Um, but you know, what is 100 years compared to an eternity without God? An eternity without God, 100 years is nothing. So why should we indulge in just uh, uh, the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life? You know, spend all our energies and our time and our money in those things that are not going to, you know, take us anywhere. I'm not saying that we should be poor, then we'll be Christians. No, that's not what the Bible says. There are poor people who are just as sinful as rich people. They are rich people who have come to know the Lord, who have been able to support the church in a very uh, wonderful way. I remember we used to attend a, a reformed conference in, in, in South Africa, in Johannesburg, for a number of years, in the 90s. And uh, there was this five-star hotel which was owned by a Christian. And he basically you know, like literally slash the prices so that the pastors can afford to pay and stay in that hotel and attend the conference. There are people like that. The Lord has used in a mighty way um, in, in terms of, uh, you know, serving the church. So the issue is not so, so much to do with rich and poor. The issue is have we but the Lord Jesus Christ on the throne. Have we uh, accepted him as our savior? Or are we still uh, wanting to amass the things of this world and we have nothing to do with the Lord Jesus Christ? I think it makes it very clear in that uh, Mark passage that we are looking at in that verse 38. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the Son of Man, will be ashamed when he comes in glory. Now that, that is very, very serious. How are we ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ today? It's when we have nothing to do with him. If you don't repent of your sin and acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have rejected him. If you want to continue living without Christ in, in this life, it means you have rejected him. It's not a matter of going to church or attending this meeting and the other. The point is, are you in the Lord Jesus Christ or not? That is the, that is the, the critical matter. If you deny me in this, in this world, I will deny you. So there's such a thing as, um, as losing. But there's also a profit. When we talk about profit and loss, there's a loss, but there's also a profit. And that comes in in Acts chapter 16 and verse 30.
And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? You remember the Philippian jailer? You know, the, the prisons were open. There was an earthquake. The prisons were opened. And, you know, he thought Paul and Silas had run away and uh, he was going to be killed. And, uh, but he found that they were busy just singing hymns there. And, they were, uh, and, he, and he comes and trembling before them and said, what must I do to be saved? And they don't notice the answer that they, uh, they gave him. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Here's a man who thought now his life was gone because they had told him you must make sure Paul and Silas are kept in the inner prison and they are chained there and they can never get out. And then the earthquake, the earthquake came and uh, they, were, they were free basically to move about and now he was trembling. He basically <coughs> realized that these men were believers. These men were, you know, full Christ followers. And so now he wanted to be a follower you know, of the Lord Jesus Christ as well. And so he says, what must I do to be saved? And notice, he is not saying, go and do a number of good works. Go and visit 10 uh, poor people. You know, go to this uh, a charity and do some work. You know, just be a good person and so on. No, 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 no. The critical matter is the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you accept that he came in this world, he suffered at the hands of the creatures, he was uh, crucified, he died, he was buried, you know, he rose again from the dead. And he did all that so that he can save us, you know, from sin. Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? And the Philippian jailer, you know, basically, you know, said yes. And he noticed that he even got baptized. You know, after this, here is an individual who realized he was a sinner. He didn't have Christ in his life. And so he was told, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Our salvation is not based on the commandments that are given in the Bible. Our salvation is based on believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our salvation is not believe, you know, based on which church we, we attend in this world. It is based on whether we know the Lord Jesus Christ or not. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The Lord says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In Acts we read about, there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved except the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the issue is not about works, not about this and the other. What is critical matter is whether you have actually come face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ and said, I am a sinner. I can't change myself. Only Jesus can be able to come and change me. And that will change concerning where your soul will be. If you are in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have profited. That, that profit has come. But if you, are, you reject him in this life while you are still alive, there is no opportunity to repent after you have died. There are some people who say, once you have died, then you have another chance somewhere. No. The Bible says, it is appointed unto man to die once, and after that comes judgment. If you reject the Lord Jesus Christ now, while you are still alive, there is no other opportunity whatsoever. That's what the Bible tells us. And so our time of repentance is now. Now when you hear his word, uh, do not harden you know, your heart. Do not harden your heart. Make sure you are in the Lord. We don't know when we are going to die. I mean, 
in Ukraine, for example, people were at peace, right? They were uh, living their lives normally, and suddenly, so many millions have been displaced. So many have died. Not even the prophets of doom in this world ever predicted that war. You know, there are some people who like prophesying about this and the other. They never even prophesied about that. And the war came, and people are suffering. We cannot take life for granted. We have to be in the Lord when we hear his word. And that way we'll be ready to meet the Lord at any time. Are you sure you are on the prophet side? Or are you on the, on the losing side? In the profit and loss accounts that we have, are you on the right side? Or are you on the wrong side? Bishop Hooper said, Life is sweet and death is bitter. But eternal death is more bitter and eternal life is more sweet. And the time that that is decided is when we are still alive. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we pray that each one of us may examine our lives and see whether we have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ or not by the way we live, by the things that are our priorities in life. Help us to surrender to the Lord. I surrender all. We have sung that and help us to mean what we say. We do pray, Almighty God, that uh, if there is anyone who still is still outside the kingdom of God, that you may be able to help them to come to him in a very personal way. So we thank you for this word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.